Well, good evening, Vanessa. Hello. How is everybody? Oh, chat's already full. I love it. That's Thank you awesome. guys so much. Hey, everybody. Wow. Hey, Susie. Oh, I'm so glad you're here. Hey, Shannon. All right. Good. We're already good to go. Sorry about that, guys. Um, a few sound issues, but we are good to go now. And um, really excited about tonight. So I'm glad there's so many people jumping in. Hey, Courtney. And then for those of you just tuning in, we normally do these um, Patreon only. We do them once or twice a week. But uh, once in a while, we decide to turn them public when we want to get the message out. But we do do the Patreon only chat. So for those of you just joining us wondering who we're talking to, those are our Patreon members. And then we're going to flip this to public, however, so that you can all share, share, share um, as much as you can this video because tonight's um, video is really important. And I'm going to go ahead and pull them on right now. We've got Taylor McAllister's parents, uh, Bill and Leslie. So let me get them in here. Hey guys. Hi. Hello there. <clears throat> All right, so we're good now. You can hear us fine and vice versa, right? All right. Oh, hey. All right. So thank you so much for being here. We're so honored to have you here and to get to talk to you. I know we I feel like I already know you because you know, seen you so much on Facebook, but just really excited to be able to talk to you in person. Well, we can't thank you guys enough for doing this for Taylor and our family and for everybody that's here tonight that's participating in this. Uh, we give a, a huge thank you uh, for all the support. Um, I don't think people realize how much that, that means to us and keeping our fight and helping us do what we need to do to get justice for her. So thank you all. Absolutely. It's our pleasure. And for those of you in comments, uh, I think it'll be best. I'd like to hear you know, the story from them and we're going to go through the case. Um, there's a lot to go through. There's a lot of layers to this. There's a lot to talk about, a lot to unpack. And so I want, I think it'd be best if we, you know, go through it that way. And then at the end, uh, we'll have some time if you guys want to ask them any questions or clarify anything. If you know anything about uh, Bill and Leslie, they are incredibly open and candid and, so anything that you guys have at the end, um, we can do it then. So just letting you guys know in advance, I'm not ignoring you. Or just, I think it's better so I can just focus on, on what they're saying. So anyway, so let's get going. Um, just for those of you, I know that there's different levels of knowledge on the case from everyone watching. So do you mind by starting us, just telling us about Taylor, who she was as a person and just helping us get to know her? Taylor just had this uh, incredible and vibrant personality. She was uh, just an outgoing, loving young lady who loved life. She loved everybody that she met, and everybody instantly fell in love with her. Um, she, and even now with, with all that's going on, uh, she just has this way of drawing people in, and uh, she just makes things better. She um, never saw bad in people. She always wanted to think good. And she loved family. She loved uh, being around the house. And that was her thing more than going out. She was never really a partier. Um, she would be much more content sitting at home with her younger sisters uh, watching SpongeBob. Or, I mean, that was just her, how she was. Uh, she, she did uh, impressions of people. She got us in trouble a lot with Leslie because she would sometimes crack us up in, in situations that she probably shouldn't be doing. And uh, she, she's just, she's so missed by so many people. And the more people that learn about her story, just fall in love with her. Yeah, I can see that. We've, a lot of us in the groups have listened to her sing on her YouTube channel. And her voice is so beautiful. I have watched every one of her videos. She was so talented. And she's so quirky too. So it makes them like yeah. they're fun. And then, and yeah. then there, then there's talent. I, you can, 
for me, you can see that she had a beautiful soul. I mean, she just was, she was beautiful. She was beautiful outside, but you could just, like, she was just so quirky and like fun and just bouncing around. And I, I was drawn immediately at, from, from mm -hmm. watching Leslie and seeing the photos of Taylor. I was just like, this is, this is important. We should be here. Yeah, I agree. Loved, loved music. We sit for hours as we've, we've mentioned all of this so many times and, and we love talking about her so uh she would just sit for hours in, in the bathroom um it, sometimes we would we would mess with her and um i would send one of her younger sisters in and she would get so mad because she would be what she felt had the best acoustics in the bathroom and they say, Taylor, it's time for dinner it's time for dinner and she would you all know, you would hear her just yell across the room uh, you know, from the bathroom because she, she was hitting the, fir the, the perfect note or, or whatever it was, but she would come running out sometimes and say, you got to listen to this. You got to listen to this song. And there would be, she would draw you in because she, she could just learn things so quickly. Did and she bring she, you in the bathroom with her? So you sometimes, could hear the perfect song? <laughs> yeah, sometimes she did. Um, but she would come running out and, and play 30 seconds and say, that's all I got and run back in. So it was kind of like, uh, you know, she, you, you would get frustrated because you just wanted to hear her sing and we could put her in the middle of the living room and just say, okay, it's, it's Taylor time. Just, just sing. Aww. It's beautiful. And if I remember uh, from the things that I've read about her too, she was self-taught right about 14 years old. She taught herself how to play the guitar. Oh, yeah. About 14, she saved up her money and she wanted to buy a guitar. Um, but she bought her own guitar, her first guitar. We still have that. And um, she sat and she watched YouTube and taught herself how to play. I don't know how she did it. I mean, she just had this raw talent. Um, of course, we're her parents, so we think she's just amazing singing. Um, but I, I just don't know how she did it. She loved to sit. And her choice of songs at that age were just very... Um, I'm so thankful to have those now because they mean so much. And when I listen, Taylor and I were always into lyrics and the meanings of songs. So we would kind of sit and ask, you know what that song's about? You know what that song's about? Um, but she would just pick some of the most amazing songs. And um, I'm so thankful. We're both so thankful to have those memories of, of her. And you're like, get out of the bathroom, Taylor. Like, stop recording yourself in the bathroom. <laughs> now you're like, extremely thankful. I can understand that. Yeah. I was just watching one of those the other day where she was recording it in the bathroom. It was one of my favorite songs. Um, so, all right. So then when everything, I don't know where we want to kind of start with this to give everyone kind of a feel, but I don't know if you want to start, you know, maybe when she was 18 or so when, with the things that were going on, but how I, I just kind of want to lead up to where, you know, everything took place. Like what was leading up to what happened? One of the things with Taylor is she was incredibly honest. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, she, I mean, she would tell us just flat out anything. And when she was about 18, she moved out and she got around some people that introduced her into some pills. And um, <clears throat> shortly after there, she called one day and said, hey, I'm doing some stuff that I shouldn't be doing and um, I need to come back home. So, of course, we said, you know, what is it and, and what are you doing? And she said, I'm, I'm taking pills and I'm doing some things that I don't want to be doing before it gets out of hand. I just need to be back home. So she came back home um, and we didn't see any issue with any, you know, drug problem. She uh, she started working at a Japanese restaurant here uh, near the house, um, was introduced to uh, one of the co-workers that she was working there. Um, they um, both started using uh, pills and things like that. And uh, at the time, we still didn't really know what if, if that there was any problem. Um, as their Taylor, as Leslie had mentioned, Taylor was, she was very impulsive, very spontaneous. She's not really one to think through an idea of and the consequences of it. So as their relationship carried on, um, 
after a few months, uh, they got married. Uh, she moved out to Seattle with him. Uh, he was in the Coast Guard. And um, their drug use continued out there. Uh, we were still unaware of it. And she one day texted and said that she was pregnant with twins. So he was going what I think the Coast Guard is called underway. Um, so we didn't want her out there by herself. So we flew her back home to have her deal with her pregnancy at the where where, where we were at. And uh, after she delivered the girls, um, they prescribed her Percocet and they prescribed her a, a large amount. And she blew through them uh, rapidly. And that's when we first knew that there was a huge issue uh, with with addiction. Okay. And then so when she, and she was with with you at that time, correct? And and then from what I had read, you guys had noticed that and then had and you had tried to intervene right a bit, correct? Uh, yeah, right after she had the the um the twins. Um we noticed that she went through those Percocet very, very quickly. And she lived at home with us and her husband went back um, to Seattle. Um, so we asked her about that, you know, why are they gone? Um, why are you going through these so fast? She was calling for a refill. So I think that that is probably the first time that we realized that there was a, a big issue. Um, not that we condone any um, use of any drugs, but kids experiment and we thought maybe she had a phase earlier you know in high school and when she was younger um but we had no idea the extent that this was um after she had the girls um i do want to note though when she did come home and she did do all her OBGYN appointments um at home she had to get drug tested because she was um young 20 at the time so i guess legally they they drug test um young mothers and I took her to every single um, appointment and she would have to do a drug test. And the whole time with the girls, she never, ever popped positive. And we would never have thought she would have anyway. Um, but it was after that, that she kind of, after the girls were born, that she went through the Percocet. And then it kind of just went downhill from, from there as she would. She got off the pills. She did really well. Six months would go by and she would kind of relapse again and she would call and uh, need help. It, it was just a, a, for about a year and a half, just a, a roller coaster um, of trying to get her, her clean and stay clean. Okay. I think for anybody who, who understands addiction, it's not something that it's, it, it's, you can't tell somebody you can't do this. They have to make the choices themselves. And when they make the choices, it's very hard for them to not fall back into a pattern that's very easy. Um, and I think many people don't know that about addiction. They just think it's a choice and well, uh, they went and did this and they went and did that. But it's, it's, it's more than that. It's, it's a desire that they want to get back into that life, even though they know how bad that life is. That's what we, we tried so many times with, with the twins, you know, like, look at your girls, look at your girls, you know, look at your sisters, just anything to, um, to try to, to make her see and to, and to do the right things. And she was, she was such a good girl. She was such a loving girl. And if there's anything, I mean, Addiction does not pick people, mm -hmm. not a certain group of people. Um, Bill and I have been married for 25 years um, this year. And, you know, we have five, five children together. Um, you know, she didn't come from a broken home. She, she had everything she needed as a, as a child. Um, and you do everything you can to raise your children. And, and this never in, in our wildest imaginations would we have thought that we would have gone through this um, and addiction is just a, it's a, a sickening, sickening disease that you are so out of, you're helpless, absolutely helpless. And you just want to shake the person and say, please, you know, please just stop. And they call her straight edge in high school because she was so anti-party. I mean, she, she didn't, she didn't go to parties in, in high school, like on Friday nights, Saturday nights, she literally was home with, with us. Um, 
and, and, you know, people used to make fun of her and I used to tell her, you know, that that's a compliment, take that as, you know, as a compliment. So it, all this was, it was a complete shock to, to us when, you know, and then you just seen this, this addiction just spiral out of control and you're a hundred percent correct with, with what you said that the people that, that have never seen it gone through it either personally or with a family member, um, friend, whatever, uh, you, you, they don't have an, any idea. I mean, what it does, how it changes the person, what it does to their, their brain receptors. I mean, we've researched so much into this and it, it is, a it, it is something that is just horrible on, on every level and, and how it affects the individual, the addict and a family. I a hundred percent understand that. Yeah, me too. Um, so then can you tell us a little bit about how she ended up um, getting, you know, entangled with Robert Butler? And I know, sure. I don't know what we can say about him or, or not, but it's the facts of the case. And oh, oh, we, we want to say a whole lot yeah, about him. Yeah. Go. Yeah. That's what we're, we're here for. Tell, I, that's what I want to hear about too. Um, a little bit about maybe his backstory too, from what I read, it's, he's got quite the lengthy history. Well, Taylor was doing very, very well um, in 2016. Um, she was clean. Everything was fantastic. Um, she, want, she wanted to be a cosmetologist. She loved makeup. She loved hair. Um, she always did her sister's hair. I mean, she she just had a, another talent for, for that. Um, and so she wanted to go to cosmetology school. We looked into that. Um, and it was right about um, August of 2016 where she kind of hit that, that downward again. And you could almost see it coming where she would do so well and so well and so well. And then all of a sudden, it's just this completely different person. Um, and Taylor was a mother uh, of twins and they were, you know, young at the time, just two. Um, her sister, her youngest sister was, was five, well, four at the time. Um, but it was about August of 2016 where she spiraled out of control and, you know, the twins lived with us and the other grandparents. Um, we had young children still, you know, Taylor's siblings and in the home, and you can't have that, especially when um, Taylor is struggling with the addiction and we have her children in that home. Um, and so we had to make that, and it's so easy for people to blame. It's so easy for people to blame the parents and where were you or where was Taylor's mother? Or where was Taylor's father? And you have no idea how much we pushed and put her through rehab and detox and dealt with and you cannot change someone unless they want to change and so that's when we did the um the tough love and and you have to you have to want this for yourself we have to take care of your sisters we have to watch out for what's best for for the twins and um and so she left um she she moved out and um she was with her husband <clears throat> at the time, they they moved while well, he wasn't living us with us, but Taylor was. Um, they they left and they were living in his car. Um, we would hear from Taylor from time to time. Um, you know, obviously we had court, you know, for the twins and, and stuff like that. Um, <sighs> well, her drug use started spiraling out of control with with harder drugs. It turned into uh, heroin use. <clears throat> Uh, crack, cocaine, um, she, she, anything that she could really get her hands on, she, she would use. Um, and when you would think that she had hit that rock bottom, she would go even further. And, you know, she had lost custody of the girls because of her drug use um, during the course of this four years. And uh, she would, like Leslie said, she would, she would bounce back and she would, you know, start the program again, she would go to a rehab. Um, and, you know, you, when, when you're watching somebody, especially your child going through something like that, and you're picking her up in the middle of the night because she's calling and begging and saying, daddy, please come get me and help me. 
and mommy, I need help. Please, please, you know, don't give up on me. Uh, it, it, it's a, it's a very difficult thing to, you can't just, you feel like you cannot, there's no way you can just walk away. You, you can't like, and, and that's where there's a struggle with where people say, you know, you have this tough love and, and people were saying, no, you got to do that. You got to do that. But you're, you're fighting because this is your kid and, and you know what the, the end result's going to be. Yeah. I mean, there's not successful drug users. There's no, you know, you don't hear of successful drug addicts and you know, it, it, it would kill us to, to get those text messages or those phone calls, they would be from random numbers. And, you know, I'm going to be at this gas station, please be there in 15 minutes. And, you know, you would jump out of bed and, and, and race to these places like that. And uh, then, you know, she, when she would tell you, I want to, I'm, I'm going to get clean. I want to get my girls back. I want to do this for them. I don't want them, I don't want them to see me. You know, this isn't the kind of mother I want to be. You're like, you, you get your hope back up. And then it just, back down again. And when, you know, addicts, they're not around the best people. And um, they're the people, Taylor was not street savvy. She wasn't, this wasn't her. I mean, she had told us that, that she would be in hotel rooms with other drug addicts and they would tell her, what the hell are you doing here? Go back home. This isn't, this isn't your life. Yeah, people that love you. We're, we're here because we have nobody. You have someone. Go home. Go home. <laughs> so that that turned into her meeting some bad people. And she met a girl that um, convinced her that to get on Backpage and said that it's really just modeling swimsuits for older gentlemen. And they'll give you the swimsuit and they'll give you money. And if anybody doesn't know what Backpage is, it's it's basically a, just a prostitution website. And so they, uh, she, Taylor was naive. She, again, she doesn't, she doesn't think anybody's going to hurt her. So she started doing this and then coupled with the drug use that escalated into her starting to prostitute. And that's how she was introduced by this girl that was basically grooming her in a sense, I guess she introduced her to Robert Butler, who was 52 at the time. And um, <clears throat> he instantly became obsessed with her. Um, if you've seen Robert Butler, uh, the pictures that we posted on him, uh, he's a piece of shit. I'm sorry. He, he just, you know, if that offends anybody, the language, but, he, he is a worthless. You're, used to me, you're fine. Okay. He, he, he's a worthless <laughs> shitbag uh, who has no purpose in this world whatsoever. And uh, he became obsessed with her. He asked her to move in with him. Um, he started giving her money, drugs, clothing. Uh, he had a, you know, four hundred thousand dollar house on the water, uh, sucking off his family's money, doing nothing but sitting around the house giving her everything that she wanted. So for a drug addict, that's a dream come true. And you know, that that's, that's what he did. He manipulated her. He used her for what he wanted. And, um, that happened around October of 2016 up until she was murdered in December. She was staying at his home. Her and her husband were living in that car. And then in October, of 2016 and we did not know any of this because Taylor did not contact us. We hadn't heard from her. Um, the last time we heard from Taylor was she texted me on my birthday, which is September 2nd. And um, just to show how just naive and, and childlike Taylor was, she, she texted me and she said, happy birthday, mommy. I know you're mad at me. I love you so much. And I mean, 22 years old and just, she still called me mommy. And um, and that kills me. And that's the last text that we ever got, um, the last contact we ever had with her. Um, her husband went to rehab um, in October-ish of 2016. And so she was left out pretty much either on the street or living with Robert Butler. And we had never heard the name Robert Butler 
until after Taylor was murdered. Um, but what we did find out is, like Bill said, he found her. He kept her in that house. Um, she lost all contact with everyone. Um, even the bad people that she was hanging out with um, said that he came became completely obsessed with her. Um, she didn't do back page anymore because she was his. Um, they sat in that house and they did drugs. And um, Robert Butler's father passed away at the beginning of December of 2016. And um, Taylor was murdered on December 22nd of 2016. And just to point out again with Taylor, I've been a paramedic for 20 years and I told Taylor a thousand times in those past four years before she was uh, murdered, I'm gonna get a phone call that you're dead in a ditch. I'm gonna get a phone call. I'm going to get a phone call that somebody is gonna hurt you. And Taylor would always say, uh-uh, mom, not me, mom. It's never gonna happen. Mommy, it's not gonna happen to me. I'm not, I, I know what I'm doing. And this man, Taylor was not doing the best things, but this man preyed on her and her addictions and her failure at rehab and losing her children. And he gave her anything that she wanted. And, um, and then he murdered her. I'm sorry, I think I'm getting a little emotional. <laughs> I'm gonna have to uh, mute myself for just a second so I can kind of clean up my own mess. I apologize, you guys. You guys really just touched me. It's, it's probably coming from our end. So on December 22nd, yeah, 2016, um, I was at work and my husband was at home and it was Christmas break. So our youngest children were, were home. And um, it was about 11.30 in the afternoon and I got um, a phone call and I was asked to come up to, to my boss's office. And um, so when I walked in, I saw um, my coworkers in there, uh, my bosses, and uh, a lady and a gentleman that I'd never met in my entire life. And they had black, black jackets on, like long windbreaker jackets. And they sat me down in an office by myself. And um, and this man that I'd never seen in my life said, I'm sorry, Mrs. McAllister, we found Taylor deceased this morning. And I know that people out there that have lost their child can, can understand that pain, but I don't think that there's any way to put that into words because it was every single emotion that you could even imagine in a split second where I was mad, I was sad, I was angry, I was crying, I was shaking, I was punching, um, just uncontrollable. And um, I asked, you know, where she was. I thought maybe she had overdosed because of the history. And um, they said she was found in an alley in South St. Petersburg, Florida, which is um, about 25 miles from where Robert Butler um, lived, about 30, 35 miles from, from where we live in Pinellas County. And, um, you know, I, I, I said, well, where, you know, where is she? Where is she? What hospital did they take her to? You know, what what is happening? And they said, she's not at the hospital. She's still um, in the alley. And they told me they found her at about 6.57 o'clock. Someone had called and said that they thought there was a body in an alley. And, um, and so I became so angry um, because they told me they were treating it as a homicide right, right from the start. Um, so my first question was, you know, what, is there a gunshot? Is there a stab? What do you mean homicide? And uh, they said, well, there's no obvious signs of trauma. However with the scene, um, we're treating this as a homicide. And by this time it's 12, 12 in the afternoon. And so I was just so angry that they left. My baby is still laying in this alley. And I understand, you know, but at, at the time, 
you know, I wasn't thinking clearly, just I wanted to get to her. Um, and then I gave them every, you know, piece of information I had, the last phone number, the last text. Um, again, we didn't know who Robert Butler was at this time, you know, um, and then they drove me home. But I'll, I'll let Bill <laughs> kind of um, tell his side on, on the 22nd because they told us separately. Okay. So I was at home. I was out in the front lawn, and, I, and our our road uh, was the, the road that we lived on at the time was a road that nobody would really go down there unless you were, lived there or somebody was visiting. There was no reason. It was a one way in, one way out kind of type area. And um, <clears throat> I saw anybody that came down, all the neighbors kind of knew what cars should be there. So when I saw this black, it was like a black sedan, and it just it kind of slowly crept down the road. Um, like you could tell it was looking for an address and then it saw ours. And uh, for me, uh, and, and I guess to put it in, in somewhat of perspective is if you watch a movie and you see certain scenes that just turn into slow motion, uh, th that's how I remember it, it happening because uh, I knew that that car wasn't there. They didn't live there. I knew, it, I mean, the way it was driving and then when it stopped at the end of the driveway and you see two uh, detectives get out and as they turn, you see St. Petersburg police, you know that, that, that it's not good. And, it, and it's a, it's a shitty, horrible, horrible feeling to see that because what goes through your mind is what would go through anybody's mind is something bad is about to be told to me. And I watched them walk up and they asked who I was and they said, uh, I says, everything okay? Is everybody okay? And they said, we need to go into the house. And when we walked in the house, uh, the one detective said, uh, and our youngest at the time was five and she was standing there and she said, we found Taylor dead in an alley this morning. Wow. And I just remember telling myself, you know, don't don't lose it because Peyton is sitting there and she's just staring at me. And, you know, the kids, they know they know if something's not right. And. Uh, there, there I don't think there's any words that exist for a, that a parent. Could describe the feeling that that. Puts on you. Uh, and they went into <clears throat> the same thing they told Leslie. There's no obvious signs of trauma. Uh, you know, it, it's we are treating this as a homicide, but we just need to get some information. And it was the same thing on that. And what time was it that they came and told you? Uh, around 11 a.m. So almost simultaneously. <laughs> me to find out and call my husband or Bill to find out and call me so they were physically in the and she was um and then everything after that was just a, a blur. I mean nothing is ever the same after that. And you have so many questions about why are they saying homicide and, and you can't get any information, which I which I understand. It's it's an investigation. Uh, we were told that day <clears throat> Do not talk to the media. You are going to have news outlets um, call you, show up at your house. And this is three days, three days before Christmas, um, which was Taylor's favorite holiday to begin with. Um, so we didn't talk to the media. We did everything that the the detectives told us we didn't, we put a note on our door. They were knocking on our door. We put a note that said, you know, no comment. Um, and, and we followed their every instruction that they gave us. Um, we had to go to the funeral home um, on the 24th on Christmas Eve and make our daughter's funeral arrangements. Um, they did not allow us to see Taylor. 
we asked multiple questions. They could not give us uh, um, any information. Um, they knew that, you know, she had, she was never in trouble. I think she had one arrest for theft when she was young, but never, never a, a lengthy record or anything like that. They had to ID her um, because of her tattoos on her arm of um, her daughter's names. And she had a big McAllister on the back of her arm tattooed. So that's how they identified her. Um, I begged them to let us go to the medical examiner's office. Once she got there, they told me, no, you can't, you can't um, wear her belongings. We don't have any, uh, just very limited information. And again, I understand that that's how an investigation goes, um, but we were patient and trusted and waited. Um, but that Christmas Eve, we, we had to go make those funeral arrangements and, um, and then come home and wrap Christmas presents because Peyton was five, our youngest, and Santa still had to come. And I think that was the longest two days of my life, but the shortest, if that makes, it doesn't make any sense, but it went by so fast, but it seemed like it was a, a split second. It, it makes no sense, but it, it's just very hard to, to put into words. Um, the first time we were able to see Taylor was six days after she was found. And again, we were told no obvious signs of trauma. We did not get to see Taylor um, prior to the service. So we had an open casket because she was beautiful and there were no obvious signs of trauma. And um, one thing I'd like to also touch on is when they told me that Taylor was dead on the 22nd, I had this pain and it was not a headache. It was just this pain right here in my forehead and it did not go away um, until I walked into the funeral home 30 minutes before her service because that's the first time we could see her. And there were signs of trauma and there was bruising around both of her arms circumferential and they were not track marks. You could see her track marks and these were bruises. Um, she had a bruise right on her forehead, right where, where I had the bruise. And um, her right ear was um, completely purple and deformed. And these were not post-mortem injuries. These were bruising while she was um, alive um, and not caused by by the autopsy. Um, and the medical examiner assured us of that, that these were, um, before she died, these injuries happened. Um, her face was completely swollen. Um, anyway, that, that was the, the worst day of, of our entire life. And, and Peyton, during the, the um, funeral, um, Peyton looked at me and she, again, is our youngest daughter, she was five. And she said, mommy, how did they make a statue of Taylor? And there's things, I mean, you remember every single second of this entire week, you know? And um, that is one thing that, that just kills me to this day that your five-year-old is asking you that about her sister. And they were stressed about the, net, the day after they found her, the detective that came and told me, called us and said, you know, hey, listen, this is looking like an overdose. Everybody's story matches up. Um, you know, it, it's it's going to come back as an overdose. But, you know, we're still treating it as a homicide. We got to wait for the, the medical examiner's ruling. But we just wanted to let you guys know as a family that that that's more than likely what this is going to be. And how many days after they found her did they call you and say that? The, the, the following day, after they found her one day. <clears throat> um, again, I uh, was paramedic in Pinellas County, and um, it's not really a big secret that police and EMS and hospital staff, they talk. You know, they talk about calls, they talk about things that happen, and, uh, and now my child is a victim. And it got back to me that there were state police officers going into ERs and saying, 
yeah, that McAllister girl, that's just an overdose. She's a junkie whore. Uh, and we did call the St. Pete Police Department and we did report that. And it was accurate because they reprimanded that, that officer. Um, so that is a true statement. And it's in the police report somewhere or on somebody's disciplinary file that someone was spoken to because of that comment. And I'm not sure as a police department how you make that comment um, a day, two days after a, a body's found and you don't have an autopsy back, you don't have a toxicology back. And I know we've posted Taylor's pictures on Facebook and we've done that for a reason because no signs of trauma is a bold faced lie. Uh, she was beaten and she is bruised from head to toe. And when the autopsy came back in February and it said uh, manner of death, homicide um, by asphyxiation by the hands of another. And there were um, multiple traumatic injuries, hemorrhaging, petechiae, um, she bit the inside of her mouth trying to breathe. She bit her tongue. There are abrasions and um, contusions all around and in her mouth trying to trying to gasp. And uh, I don't think that if someone overdoses, they they cause those injuries. Right. The, the detective was kept stressing the importance of the medical examiner's ruling. He said that's that's pretty much golden in this investigation. Um, that's going to determine, you know, what we do, how things are handled, and because they thought it was going to come back as an overdose. And what what happened when it didn't come back as an overdose, they went into basically an oh shit panic mode because they knew that they had screwed up. They knew that they 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 hadn't served a warrant on that house, um, and they uh, stressed how great this medical examiner was until he ruled it a homicide. Then they started bashing him and criticizing him and saying, he doesn't know what he's talking about. This should have been ruled undetermined. Um, and I think they were, they, they treated her as they, in this case, as they called her, uh, she wasn't a junkie whore who OD'd. And, but, but when you have that mindset from a police department, that, that's how they treated this investigation. And yep. they were certain that she it was gonna it was gonna be overdose. And not only was it not an overdose, the medical examiner, the only thing they found in her system were cocaine metabolites. And if for people that don't understand that, because we didn't, um, they said the medical examiner told us that, that could have she could have taken that up to five days prior to, and it is impossible to overdose on metabolites because your system has already broken the drug down. There's, there's nothing to overdose on. He said, there is no way that this was an overdose. This is a homicide. And he was as shocked when we met with him because he's one of the, him, uh, he and the investigator, the medical examiner investigator uh, were, were very professional, were very respectful to Leslie and I and to Taylor. And they were as shocked as we were that an arrest had not been made uh, for murder. So I want to back up a minute so everyone can understand just how poor this was uh, as far as the, what happened afterwards. So as you heard them say, it was on December 22nd when she was found. The autopsy, if I'm correct, didn't come back until February, right? Right. And so... They didn't rule it one way, like pending toxicology. Yes. Yeah. Homicide um, pending toxicology. We've got to wait. We've got to wait for toxicology. Um, but they were banking that, that this was going to come back as an overdose. <clears throat> if you've seen those pictures, I don't know how you could even come to that conclusion just from the scene. And then to tell parents that there's no obvious signs of trauma is just unfathomable i don't i don't understand how you could say that we told that to the medical examiner to us. uh that what the police had said because he said 
they, they were present during the autopsy. They saw all the things that I saw. And we have since found out that this medical examiner is one of the most thorough medical examiners in that, that office. Um, he told us that Taylor had the worst case of petechia he's ever seen in his career, which is that's the redness in the eyes. People don't know the redness in the eyes. Um, it's like little dots little uh, where, you know, bro uh, the, yeah, the, the broken blood vessels. But he said that was the worst case he had ever seen. And she had it. She had it everywhere. Um, I mean, she had the shit beat out of her. There, there's no other way to, to, to put it. I mean, she was, as, as I said, covered. In, in, from head to toe and bruises, uh, you can see the the marks on her neck. It uh, it, it almost looks like the outline of, of a hand, and the the medical examiner did his job. The police didn't, and then you know that that's when, and I may be jumping ahead. So, um, but You're that's fine. When, that's when the finger pointing started. They started the police started blaming everybody, and. Uh, it's just they know they screwed this case up. Yeah. So, so then between December and February, like we were talking about earlier on the phone, did they serve a search warrant and search uh, Butler's house or? So we had no, no um, answers to any of our questions. And again, we didn't get to see Taylor, you know, until six days after, um, after she was murdered. And so we started kind of, you know, where was she? What, you know, was she just walking the streets and safe? You know, we're trying to figure out, you know, where where had she been? Um, and it was her um, her husband Josh, who was in rehab at the time, said, you know, she had been staying with an older gentleman by the name of Bert. And so that's all we had to go on is Bert and his family had a lot of money and owned a business. <clears throat> and so we started digging and digging and um, Taylor had a few very good friends that she went to middle school through um, that were always trying to help us help Taylor. Uh, they were good, good friends of hers. Um, and they were getting text messages and saying, if, if Taylor's death comes back as a homicide, Robert Butler did it. If Taylor's death, you know, I know he did this. I, and, just random texts her girlfriends were receiving. And of course we gave any information that we were getting to, to the police um, as well. So what had um, what we had found out is that Taylor was staying with Robert Butler, Robert Henry Butler III, a 51 year old pervert. Mm -hmm. um, and Something happened on the night of the 21st into the 22nd um, where Taylor lost her life. And he, Robert Butler, did something to her, causing those injuries. And then I think he panicked and called um, three men from South St. Pete to come up and help him. But he did not tell them why. And so when those three men, um, Deontay Baker, Kiran Archer, and D um, showed up at the house. <clears throat> they were high. And Butler took them back into his bedroom where they say she was laying naked on his bed, moaning in pain, not speaking, um, just moans. And she had urinated uh, on the bed. And Robert but Butler told them, get, get, I need her out of the house. So the story is that um, Baker said, we need to call 911. And Butler said, no, I have drugs in the house and I'm a felon. And so they loaded her up into Robert Butler's truck. They put her in the back seat of Robert Butler's truck. Um, she couldn't walk. She couldn't talk. They carried her lifeless body out and put her in the back seat of that car. And Robert Butler was supposed to get in that truck and they were supposed to take her to the hospital. However, Robert Butler went back into his house and never came back out. And so now you have these three men 
in a driveway, three black gentlemen with a naked white girl in the back of a rich white man's pickup truck. And so they said they were going to take her to the hospital. And Kieran Archer took off with Taylor in Robert Butler's truck. And he wasn't from this area. So he passed hospitals and ended up in St. In St. Pete, which is 25 miles away. And um, somewhere from when they put her in the back of that truck to when he got down to St. Pete, he said that she died. Kieran Archer said that she died. So the three gentlemen flipped out. They called Robert Butler, and this is all in the police report and all the interrogation videos. Um, they called Robert Butler and they said, she's dead, she died. She's in the back of the truck, we have to come back. And his words to um, Baker was, you're not bringing her back here, get rid of it, take care of it. And so the three men contemplated, what do we do? What do we do with, with this body? And so um, they ended up taking her to an alley in South St. Pete. They said they gently placed her on the ground. However, if you've seen the crime scene videos, she was pulled out of that truck. Crime scene, I'm sorry, photos. She was pulled out of that truck um, with nothing but a gray t-shirt pulled up all the way to her chest, legs spread open and then run over by Robert Butler's truck run over and then they went back to Robert Butler's house and burned Taylor's clothes and they burned surveillance tapes that were at Robert Butler's house because he's quite wealthy and lives in a very nice neighborhood and a very expensive home and uh, had surveillance all around his house and inside his house. They burned all of that. They burned the sheets, they burned their clothes. Um, they sent Kiran Archer to the gas station to buy lighter fluid. Fluid, because Robert has a fireplace in his house, and so they burned all of their things. Um, and then they went on about their their night and went home and went to bed. Um, and Robert Butler got a visit that next morning from the police department because Taylor's husband gave them Robert's name. And when the police arrived at Robert Butler's house. He told them he didn't know Taylor. He had met her maybe two or three times. She never lived there. He hadn't seen her in eight days. Um, and it's noted again in the police report that Robert Butler on December 22nd had scratches to the bridge of his nose across his forehead on his face and bruises to his shoulder. And that's noted in the police report on the day that Taylor was found. But to answer your question, <clears throat> no, they did not serve a search warrant uh, at any time until almost a year later. Um, we asked repeatedly about that and we were given three different answers by a, uh, she's a major now, her name is Shannon Halstead at St. Pete Police Department. She was involved in overseeing the case. And uh, she said the first one of the, one of the answers she gave us was they didn't have enough. Um, the second answer, she said that they, um, they didn't think it was worth getting a search warrant. And the third, and this is the most disturbing is, uh, she said that they tried and she was, when, when she, when I asked her about this, the third time she, she was raising her voice and saying, we tried, we tried to get a search warrant. This, the, the assistant state attorney refused to take it to a judge. So the search warrant, and we still can't get clarification on this because nobody can seem to produce any documentation on the search warrant. And when we met with the chief of St. Petersburg Police and his upper administration to discuss Taylor's case and, and how it was handled, they told us that a search warrant, the search warrant that was issued um, where they spoke to to Robert Butler. That's one of the interview tapes that we had played where he's at his house. Um, wasn't even for Taylor's case. It was for federal charges. It was also a year later. Yeah. One year. So I mean you're not gonna <clears throat> you're not gonna find anything after I mean 
a year. I mean, these, these are stupid individuals, but they were smart enough to destroy the surveillance footage. And, and you know, that one of the, the questions, I know if, if I hadn't done anything, the last thing I would want to destroy is surveillance footage. Right. I would want to show exactly what happened. I mean, I would happily hand it over to somebody, you know. And was any remnants of any of that stuff ever found? Or is it just the word of these guys that are saying they burned everything? Did they ever find any, like, no, thing left it, from the burn pile? No, because it was a year after um, Taylor was murdered that they actually went into the home and did the search warrant. He had a fireplace in the house, so they just burned everything in the, in the fireplace. And that was um, um, Huron Archer made that statement. Um, they did discard Baker. some of her items, Taylor's items in. Uh, Deontay Baker admitted that some of the items, because they, they took out black garbage bags and they went to various apartment dumpsters, um, apartment complex dumpsters, and just threw them in random dumpsters, uh, whatever they didn't burn. And they did, they did talk to Robert Butler. Um, Again, he said he hadn't seen her in seven or eight days, um, that he'd only known her and seen her a few times from Backpage. And then as soon as they asked for a DNA swab, um, he called his attorney. And then his attorney asked them to leave the house. So, um, I mean, if you're innocent, you didn't do anything, then why, why not just submit your DNA or why not cooperate? I mean, is there any strategy. like video or audio of this um, uh, interaction between the cops and Robert Butler on the 22nd when he has the scratches? Is there anything okay. besides what's written in that report? All I can, all I have, all we have is what's written in the report. And I have asked, did you take pictures? Did you pull his shirt up? Did you look at his arms? Did you take pictures? They tell me, yes, we did. There's no recording. They didn't record any of that conversation. Um, they did tell me that they did take pictures, but I, we have not been able to obtain those pictures because I would love to see those. Um, but we have not been able to get, get our hands on those. When they did serve the search warrant, um, and, and this, is, this is odd because they destroyed all of, the, all, all of everything else that, that belonged to her except the guitar and a monogrammed Bible that she has. And they found those during the search warrant. So we have those back, thankfully. Um, but for some reason, he didn't, he didn't destroy those. S somebody had mentioned one time, and I don't you know, get into the psychology of all this, but they said that it was, it was his way of keeping like a keepsake of her, which is why he didn't destroy it. And the Bible, you know, the, he, he wasn't going to, they, they, some people said that he doesn't, they don't feel like he was going to destroy a Bible like that. But I mean, I, I don't think Robert Butler is really concerned where. I'm just thinking, yeah, what, what, what I believe he probably did do and versus burning a Bible. I, I think he's pretty screwed already. Burning the yeah. Bible is not going to change that for him, but that's just my opinion. Allegedly, in my opinion, I'll say all the phrases I have to say for social media purposes. So I want to back up a little. Well, first of all, we do have for all of you that want, and, and I, I think you really should go listen to them. I've listened to them before. Um, the all of the police interviews we have um, under, you know, in a playlist on our <laughs> channel. And I just want to note that those are, you know, she was murdered December of 2016. Those interviews, correct, are from December 12th, I think, of 2017. Yeah, I'm, I'm fully later so but and then when when they did question them they all had different versions of this story correct from each other well there's Cute. yes there is um tapes or videos um of them questioning them sometime right after um taylor's murder However, we don't have those and we cannot get those. So the only ones that we have been able to, to get are the ones um, from the search warrant that happened um, a year a year later um, where they, they interviewed Robert Butler in his driveway at his house while they were doing a search warrant. So they're 
I mean, that's that's how serious this homicide investigation is, is there's other detectives in the background asking questions. Where's your keys? Can I put your dog on the porch? Do you want some tea? Uh, what kind of bike is that? What year is that bike? I mean, this is a murder investigation. Our child, and you're talking about tea and motorcycles a year? What do you think you're gonna find a year later? And two, how, how dare you disrespect a, a human life like that and not have enough decency to bring this man down to the station in an interrogation room and ask him those hard questions. I don't, I don't, I don't understand how any of this is, has even happened. I, it, it makes no sense. Some, some have said, oh, he was just trying to make Butler feel comfortable. And, you know, that's just a tactic that, that certain officers use. If you listen to that, that interrogation, uh, the majority of the people, and we've, we've had just about everybody that, I mean, you, you know, that will share anything. Uh, I mean, you've, you've, everybody's seen it. Um, but the majority of the people that have seen that other attorneys, uh, other law enforcement have said that is one of the worst, if not, and, and this is the general consensus to this, if not the worst interview that they've had, they've ever heard. And that that detective should never be interviewing anybody. Um, this, I don't even I don't even know if I would consider it an interview. It literally yeah. was just the conversation the guy was having with him while they were in the driveway. That's the one part of that uh, interrogation um, of Robert Butler is when they finally put him in the back of a police cruiser to, to quiet the noise and actually read him his Miranda rights and and the warrant. Uh, he starts taught the detective, Detective Jim Regula, starts asking him, you know, Taylor, you know, we're here because, you know, your friend Taylor was was um, was murdered. Well, I don't even think he says the word murdered. I think died is what he said. And Robert Butler asks him to clarify something. And then the tape just stops and there's no more tape. So what 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 happened in that car? What did they talk about after that? I mean, the tape just stops after all the bullshit about the bike and tea and can we put the dog away? Now you're finally going to say the word Taylor in a controlled environment. And now the tape just shuts off and there's there's nothing more on tape after that. They were having technical difficulties is the response they gave us when we asked. They've lost one of the interviews. They can't, they can't find it. They don't know what happened to it. The, Which one is that? That's the one that we'll refer to him as as D. Um, okay. The uh, the third the, party. Yeah, that the, that's the one that they are definitely afraid of. That they mention in the when when they're reluctant to answer who it is. That's who they're re they're referring to. That's the one that after all this was over said, "This is the story." And again, if I'm jumping ahead, we can back up. But um, that's the one that. He's the one that they're they're referring to when they say, um, "Bo" is another one, but th that's not his legal name. Um, and he's the one that they all claim threatened to put a bullet in their fucking head if they didn't go to, go along with the story that she overdosed. When they questioned Bo, they did it in a parking lot on a detective's cell phone recorder, and that that uh, recording. And it's in the police report as well that 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 recording has been lost or is inaudible. So nobody knows what that conversation consisted of. I mean, I don't know what world that we live in that that this investigation is this screwed up. And then we make a complaint about the police department and the chief of police tells us we investigate our own department internally. And we see nothing wrong with this investigation. Three times they've told us that. You can file a complaint, but we investigate the complaint. Well, the so they're going to investigate their own issues regardless. Right. They don't have like a internal affairs that's well, going to come do. in. From... They, they okay. But he, he said after internal affairs gets done with it, it comes to me anyways. So, and he said, and I'm the one who makes the decision on what happens. So file your complaints if you want. Did you file? Uh, yeah, well, 
this this is what's and, and it's not funny, but I mean it when we were in the last meeting, he asked, he said, Do you want to file a complaint? There's clear policy violations here of what some of these officers have done during this investigation. Do you want to file a complaint? We said, Yes, absolutely. So when internal affairs called us, they looked over everything and said, we don't see any violations of policy here. So there's nothing that we can do. Hmm. So one of, the complaints, one of the complaints was during the investigation. And when, when we got the, the first police report, um, when I finally was able to get a copy of that. So it was probably six months, six months in to the investigation. I was able to get the first copy of the police report um, and I had to go to St. Pete and pick it up. I'm reading it as Billy's driving on the way home and it literally says in there, DNA match Robert H. Butler under her fingernails and on her neck. It's a CODIS hit because he's a convicted felon. They didn't really need that swab, but they got the swab anyway, eventually. Um, Nobody else's DNA was on her. And, um, you know, Taylor, like I said, wasn't living the best lifestyle. Her nails were very, very short, not manicured at all. Uh, she liked to bite her nails. And so her nails were very, very short to begin with. And DNA was caked under her fingernails. And that handprint on her neck has his DNA on it not to mention the fresh scratches to his face the day that they talked to her, but there's not enough evidence because they lived together in everything I have ever read or I have looked into the first person that you look at in a murder investigation is the spouse. I can tell you right now that my husband's DNA isn't under my nails and on my neck right now, caked under my fingernails. That's the first person they look at. And that was our, the answer they gave us is, well, they lived together, so his DNA could be on her. That was something I wanted to know. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry. Uh, when, I, my apologies. Um, the detective, Jim Regula, that when we when we saw this in the police report, we called him and, and told him, said, Jim, there's there's DNA found. You know, I mean it's it's Butler's is the only DNA that was found. And he said, and and again, he raised his voice and he said, no, there wasn't. There was no DNA found on, on, on Taylor. There was no DNA found. What are you talking about? And I said, Jim, it's in your report. It's in the report that you wrote. And he said, no, there wasn't. There wasn't. I, I, I don't even know what you're talking about. If DNA would have been found, it would have made a huge difference in this case. So I took a, a picture of it with my phone and sent it to him. And of his, his own report. Of his own report. And, and, and his response was, well, I got a lot of cases. I can't remember everything. And then it suddenly became not important anymore. Doesn't change anything at that time. Like that's what he's basically saying was it would have been a game changer. But now that it's in my own report, I, it doesn't matter anymore because I have a lot of cases. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it, it this case is, is just disgusting on a whole nother level that I mean, and I know there's a lot of other families that, that we've unfortunately had to meet because of this in, in, in set of circumstances, but the, the, the gross incompetence by this department really, it, it's, it's almost unbelievable that, that they are this bad. And this is a department that has last count 200, uh, 213 unsolved homicides. And this isn't a town like, you know, a Chicago or a Detroit or, you know, anywhere like that, you know, St. Pete is, is, it's a, it's just a, uh, a normal, you know, smaller town compared to, to someplace like that. But you can you can understand why they have such a high uh, unsolved homicide rate, because if this is how they're handling investigations. Right. I mean, and, and we had one uh, attorney <laughs> that told us that they were a defense attorney and they said, um, we love when we see arrests made by St. Pete because we know that the case is pretty much winnable and no, no matter what, because they do such a piss poor investigation in, in the way that they handle things. 
And you can Google St. Petersburg Police Department and there will be a plethora of, you know, information that that pops up about how corrupt that, you know, how much corruption is going on there. And, you know, the how, how the officers are. It's known around these parts as that's the department you go when you can't get hired anywhere else. Oh, gosh. That's exactly the story I wanted you to tell. You beat me to it. That is exactly what I wanted you to tell. Because when I heard that, I could not believe that. That he was that he was arguing with you about his own report. There's so many points in this that I can't believe. It's it's just I don't even I was trying to think of the word for it. it it's just absolutely astounding of, of what of what happened and, and what you guys have had to put up with. And then there's also the point that I think that we forgot to. I got so sucked into the story I forgot to bring up in the autopsy report. Um, and correct me if I make any mistakes here. On top of the the asphyxiation. And the petechia that was on her chest, I believe, correct? And her eyes. Um, yes. And hemorrh hemorrhaging to her neck, um, cuts and abrasions. And there are 28, her mouth. 28 contributing factors. And the first 11 of those are um, traumatic. Um, the bruising, the the abrasions, the we we did ask the medical examiner because the story was they put her in the back of the car, and then she died. <clears throat> uh, we asked the medical examiner point blank, could it have been positional asphyxiation? Could she have tipped over and cut her airway off? And he said, absolutely not. This is not a positional. Her hyoid bone was not broken, so there's no no fracture here. However, there's um, swelling, abrasions, and um, hemorrhaging all internal uh, to the chest and to the neck. And like I said, one of those pictures, you can um, you can see a handprint there. Um, and she, there, were, there were, you know, other contributing factors listed on there. I mean, but because of her drug use, she, she had hepatitis, it showed that she had a stroke, uh, an enlarged heart, um, some kidney, um, I guess, disease from, from the drug use. And so whatever the medical examiner would have ruled, we would have accepted that. I mean, he's the one, it's not like we had any, any influence over him putting homicide, you know, as, as the cause of death with, with asphyxia. So we asked about that and he said, yeah, she was sick. He said, but I can tell you right now, that's not what caused her death. This is no doubt a homicide. And we've had since then, uh, a cardiologist look over this and he said her heart that was in the normal range of somebody who had died. Um, we've had the medical director of this county look at it and he agreed with the medical examiner. He said, yeah, she had some sickness, but he said the first 11 that's listed on that autopsy, that's the problem right there. That that's her, her cause of death. And if I can hit on the um, the stroke real fast, it is Taylor had, like Bill said, just the uh, metabolites in her system. So I don't know if she was trying to leave Bert's house. Obviously, she wasn't high. She wasn't in that um, that state of mind, and um, I don't know if she tried to leave, and he choked her out. Um, but I know that when you cut somebody's airway off and then say, oh shit, before they die, you could cause that stroke. And if you read their statements about when they walked in that house, um, Dee and Archer and Bert brings them back to the room, that's exactly what a stroke victim looks like that has a, a bleed, a head bleed. And her autopsy shows a head bleed. I think he choked her. I, d I don't know how, but somehow choked her and um, caused that stroke, which is why she lost, um, why she urinated and why she couldn't speak and why she couldn't walk and why she couldn't help, why she couldn't call for help, why she couldn't scream because he caused that stroke and she was dying when they got there. And she just happened to pass in the back of that truck after he strangled her. 
And there's also, for those of you who don't know, there was tape residue on her wrists. And if I'm correct, it was on her cheeks, correct? Yes. Right. Tape residue, yes. So. Yeah, they, they sent a, they told us they sent a roll of tape to the FBI. It um, came back as female DNA, but it wasn't Taylor's on there. That's, I guess, the rule that they found at Butler's house. Um, <clears throat> also in the police report, uh, they did a controlled phone call with Deontay Baker where he called Robert Butler at his house. And, uh, we posted this as well. We will, some of the things for the, for the people that are listening, you know, if you go to our Facebook page, we post a lot of different things like this, but during this controlled phone call, they had him call and ask Butler what he did to the girl. And he said that the police have been, you know, on him all day. What'd you do to the girl? And Butler's response was, come up to the house and I'll tell you. And in the police report, it just kind of stops and goes to another paragraph. And they never allowed him to go up there and, and talk to Butler. Now, if you, I think we would all agree, if somebody said, hey, what did you do to that girl? and you didn't do anything, your response isn't going to be come to the house and I'll tell you. It's going to be what the hell are you talking about? I didn't do anything to her. That's what my response would be. And I'm sure everybody else is. So, um, and in the jailhouse interview that Leslie, when she went and spoke to Deontay Baker, he, he mentions that. And he said he was willing to do whatever to find out what happened to Taylor. Deontay Baker's story has pretty much remained consistent through everything. Uh, we don't think that he's the one who murdered her. We don't think Kieran Archer is the one who murdered her. And we don't think Bo's the one that murdered her. Uh, there's no question in our mind that Butler did it. Um, and the uh, some of the things that they say is different in, in some of the interviews. But the the main parts of everything of what happened that night have pretty much remained the same from the beginning of when they, they started talking to the police. When was the first time the police did talk to them? How did they find out th about them? I believe it was within day. Well, Butler was the, the day that they found her. Um, but then he says, I haven't seen her for days. So how did they get to these other guys? Uh, I think just the questioning, which we can't get a hold of, but listening to them and then talking to Deontay is they all had the same story. We were all going to say she overdosed and we dumped her in an alley. We freaked out and we dumped her in an alley. And then um, when it came back homicide, they all freaked out again and came up with, you know, this new story. And I don't think they could keep it, keep it straight. And, you know, the, the really shitty thing about this is when they did do that um, warrant a year later, it was for money laundering. And so Bert is loaded with a trust fund and money doesn't have to worry about it whatsoever. It just comes flowing in and Deontay and Kiran and Bo live in South St. Pete in not a great area. And uh, it was found during this investigation because the FBI got involved or the IRS, IRS got involved and um, they found money laundering. And so Robert Butler was writing checks to Deontay Baker um, and Deontay Baker's girlfriends and Kieran Archer. And those checks equaled, um, were over $500,000 when we went to federal court and watched all of this play out. Uh, checks were written for over $500,000. So Bert had been paying these guys even before Taylor, you know, these, this was drug money. These were for drugs. However, Deontay and Bo and Kiran, they're not going to turn on their, on what feeds them. I mean, I mean, Bert's paying them and they're driving around, you know, nice cars and, and Bert's got a, you know, even during the federal trial, um, Deontay Baker says, you know, Bertie's got a, Bertie used to have a yacht down in, in South St. Pete and, I used to be able to bring my girls there and we'd just, you know, stay there for weeks on this, on this boat. I mean, for free. So of course they're not going to wrap Bert out. 
because he's the one paying them. And then <laughs> something else that I found interesting when we watched that, and this is also there, but you went to visit uh, Deontay in jail. Did you get, I mean, I, I couldn't, that was a hard one to get there. That was, um, did you get what you, anything that you wanted out of that? Well, I wasn't getting, we weren't getting anything out of the cops because they just completely shut us out um, by this point in the investigation. And he was in jail um, because when they did arrest them in December of 2017 for failure to report a death, which is a misdemeanor, that's what they got charged with, a one-year misdemeanor. And Bert, two of the three of them. Three of them. All three yeah, of them but got only two, All three of them got charged, but only two ended up in jail. Well, no, no. Uh, Arch turned against Butler for the failure to report a death, so they cut a deal with him. He served four months of a, the max they could get was a year. Okay. So, but Archer served four, four months. Um, Butler had his attorney drag out the state charges because he knew he was facing federal charges. And in federal charges, they, they go with a, it's like a scale of what your criminal history is that that's part of the scale on how much time you're going to get. So, um, he, he drug his state charges out as long as he could. And he ended, ended up pleading guilty after his federal charges to the failure reported death. He was sentenced to a year on that charge, but he served eight months of it. That's just how, how it works. And Deontay Baker, um, he, he is a very stupid individual. And after his federal charges and he was found not guilty on the drug charges, federal side, he had already served over a year on the hold for the failure to report a death. So after he got found out guilty, he pretty much had served his time on the failure to report a death if he would just plead guilty. All he had to do is plead guilty. And it, it was pretty comical the day that we went to court on him because he thought he was going to get out of jail. And had he pled guilty, he would have. But he actually wanted to fight the figure to report a death. So that meant he was going to still stay in jail, which is what happened. And his lawyer just looked at him like, are, are you an idiot? Just plead guilty. And but that's how stupid he is. So he spent like another two weeks in jail before he finally was convinced. If you just plead guilty, you're out today. You're done. So he finally did after that. Uh, they dropped the other felony charge of possession of ammunition on Butler, even though he admitted post Miranda, it was his, they dropped that charge and they dropped the, uh, they, they ran the um, felony possession of marijuana charge concurrent to the failure to report a death. So he got no, no additional time for that. Okay. So then you went and saw Deontay, correct, Leslie? So it was um, during the, Federal after the year in 2017, where they all got in, in um, they all got arrested, and Butler has the money to to post bond, so he's out. I don't even think he made it to the jailhouse. He was already posted bond before they even got to jail. Um, but of course, Baker uh, doesn't have the money to get out, and Bert doesn't pay for it. So that's why Baker was still in there. And this is when the federal charges started happening. And so now we're getting this information about money laundering and, and all of this other stuff. And I still don't have any answers about Taylor. So I know that that Deontay's sitting in county jail and Bert's not bailing him out. And now Robert Butler Bert is uh, turning against Deontay. So I wanted to go and tell Deontay that Bert was throwing him under the bus. Please tell me what happened. I mean, that was just a, um, I don't, we didn't have any answers. It was just a shot yeah, in the dark. And I just, um, I just wanted to see what he would tell me. And when he did tell me that, you know, the cops, all they wanted was a big drug bust and that Deontay did call Butler 
and uh, asked what he did to the girl. And he said, you know, Mrs. Callister, I, I told them I'd go up there. I told them I'd wear a wire. I told them I'd go up there and they wouldn't let me. And uh, I don't understand why that that never happened, especially when Butler said in a controlled phone call, come up here and I'll tell you. Um, but that I think was one of the hardest things that I've had to do is sit there and uh, and listen to him. But I, I, we can't get it. We couldn't get any answers from from anybody else. Yeah, that was that was a rough one. And that all was. all of them stuck with, if I remember right, all of them stuck with that nobody touched her. Like nobody oh, would yeah, say yeah. that they were the ones that touched her or moved her or. Well, that's Deontay because. Baker said, he, he, he said, I offered my DNA. I didn't ever lay a finger on her. He said, I, I right. never touched her. Here on Archer, um, this is, and this is where the interviews where they start talking. They mentioned Bo and, and who the other individual was involved. Um, finally said that Bo picked Taylor up and put her in the back of Butler's truck when they took her from the house and that Bo was the one that picked her up out of the truck to dump her in the, to put her in the alley. Um, so I, I believe that Archer said he didn't touch her either. Um, but we know Butler's DNA was the only one found on her. Um, I guess they tested in the police report, it says they tested everybody's DNA and his was the only one found on her. And according, as Leslie had mentioned before, when we brought that up to, because they wouldn't let Jim Regula or Shannon Halstead part of any of these meetings because we had a whole lot of questions for them. And uh, yeah. they would not let them be a part of that that meeting because, you know, that that's what got us shut down by them in the, in the first place is we started asking too many questions and they didn't like the questions we were asking. And once um, we mentioned that to Holloway, Chief Anthony Holloway of St. Petersburg Police, um, that's when he said, well, DNA is not really relevant because when you live with somebody, and, you know, um, and then we asked the assistant state attorney, the ones that they said refused to take the search warrant to the judge. And his response was, well, DNA only matters on TV. It's this isn't TV. And there's plenty of case law that show that it doesn't matter. And, uh, and I said, well, give me that case law because I think you're full of shit. And uh, he got mad and hung up the phone. And wow. they, none of them, none of them will talk to us um, at this point. And they've said that we, we will not um, talk to you guys at all anymore. Is there so, okay, so I have, I have two questions. Sorry, Vanessa. No, 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 go. No, go. Um, did you ever find out why they never served a search warrant from February? So, okay. So they say, you know, you have this whole, oh, she's just this junkie whore. We don't really need to serve a search warrant up until February. Now it's ruled an actual homicide by the medical examiner. Why is there no search warrant from February to December of 2017? If you, have that, if you can find that answer. Let us know because we've asked multiple times. And that's where Shannon gave us, Shannon Olsen gave us those, those answers. So, you know, we took it to the state attorney and they said we didn't have enough. And, and uh, you know, it just gave us the, the runaround. And once we did start questioning them and then we did try to get Taylor's story out there, um, a couple local reporters kind of would, would touch base, but they wouldn't say anything bad about St. Pete or the investigation. Um, but Shannon Halstead, the major in charge of that investigation, was asked for a statement by the Tampa Bay Times and completely victim shamed um, Taylor that, um, yes, technically it's a, and this is in the Tampa Bay Times, yes, it's technically a homicide. However, there are 28 other contributing factors and Taylor had um, acute and chronic um, drug abuse. Who, what police department says that about a victim? Well, she goes to enlist. She says, oh, she had hepatitis, she had this, she had that. And and these are the same people that were telling us, listen, the medical examiner's ruling is, is the utmost importance in this case until it came back as a homicide. And then it was, you know, they criticized everything. How long he took, he doesn't know what he's doing, you know, it, 
all the things I mentioned before. So it, it really was just a whole lot of finger pointing. They started blaming the assistant state attorney. Um, they said that he completely destroyed the case for them. Um, it, I mean, it, they blamed sheriff's, uh, the sheriff's department assisted them with the warrant um, when it finally was served. And they started blaming them. Uh, anybody that they could point a finger at, th they did it. And they're, they're, they're still doing it um, up until the last meetings that we had with them earlier last year. And we found a picture of Anthony Holloway um, with the chief, the chief, Chief Anthony Holloway of St. Petersburg. Um, mm -hmm. We found a picture of him with Butler's defense attorney um, in the middle of this investigation, in, in the middle of Taylor's investigation. And we questioned him about that. I mean, why, why would a chief of police be with the main suspect in a homicide investigation that your very department is investigating? And he claimed he didn't know who he was. Well, I think that the problem there is, as you said, that while his department is investigating. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if that was actually happening at the time. Exactly. Well, true. Exactly. And a, so, a PI we spoke with who knows, very familiar with Butler's defense attorney, because he used to be a former prosecutor also in this area. Um, his name is Kevin Hazlett. This is public record. So anybody can see who represented Butler. Um, uh, a private investigator said, uh, I can tell you right now, he's very well connected in this area. And if people, this was verbatim, if people think that deals aren't being cut behind closed doors, they're a fool because it happens every single day. Yeah. And uh, this, this Kevin Hazlett is basically on Butler's speed dial. He got him off on Butler's had multiple DUIs. Um, he's false imprisonment. Uh, he's domestic violence on his wife, his criminal history, you can pull it up just in, just in Pinellas County is, I, I think it's three or four pages if, I, if I'm not mistaken, but he gets off with nothing but a slap on the wrist every single time. It's just, it's just pay a fine and you're done. And we even had his ex-wife reach out to us, uh, through social media, which we were very honestly shocked. And she said, there's th this, this guy is 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 an animal essentially she said he had he had beat me he strangled me he slammed my head into granite countertops he threw me across the room and uh broke my tailbone he he's had to have people have had to, to pull him off of me he is out of control and his temper is is just he he cannot control it and we asked him if they would with his ex-wife with butler's ex-wife and i said it's not relevant it's not relevant to taylor's case and I said it shows it history. shows his history. It There's shows a whole lot not relevant to Taylor's case, apparently. Yeah, right? and, and and I know a lot of people are wondering like where the corruption comes in. And I know we've been talking so long, so I'm sorry, but where the oh, corruption comes in is, is Butler's Butler's loaded with money. And we've had people tell us, like Bill said, if you think there's not deals being made, there's deals being made. And I don't want to get off topic. Um, but Robert Butler's own sister um, in 2006 here in Pinellas County gave birth to a baby boy at her home and um, put it in a dresser drawer and killed, it. and killed it and put it in a dresser drawer. And she got off with felony or no, manslaughter. manslaughter. Her name is Robin Farley. Again, this is all public record. So you're, there's nothing you, anybody can find this information. The wow. family has connections. The family is loaded. I don't know who's paying who. Robert Butler was, it came out in federal court by his own admission. And again, you can pull transcripts on this. Uh, he admitted to be in being involved with uh, in the overdose of an underage female down in Manatee County. He had, he admitted that flat out when he was cross-examined. Wow. I mean, this this guy. When, when I say he is truly a monster and and somebody who who serves absolutely no purpose in this world, uh, there could not be a truer definition other than Robert Butler. I mean, he's he literally is just an animal. Did and was he ever? He admitted to that. Was any did any no charges or anything for any of that either? We can't find anything on it. We cannot. We've we've researched. I think because she was underage. I don't know if. Maybe. 
We can't. Yeah. We can't. Yeah, we will. Do, do you guys know how much of like the police reports and files or audios that you guys don't have that you know exist? No, but I do believe that that's why they keep this as a cold case. One, it's not a cold case, but I truly believe that's why they keep it as a cold case. That way they don't have to close it and then they don't have to disclose all the other stuff. That right. they're I, I really believe that. If they could close this out and know that we weren't going to question anything or we weren't going to ask for, for all the other transcripts or this or that, um, I think they would close it out in a heartbeat. But them knowing that we are constantly asking and constantly bashing them for for failing Taylor, uh, they're going to keep this open as a cold case and until we die. I mean, uh, honestly. I think they uh, have some legal recourse there, but I'm not an attorney, so I don't want to speak out have, of turn. But I, I know that there's, there are, if they're not doing anything with the case, we have there's got to be a legal right. avenue to take to get that information so somebody can do something legally with the case. We have asked and begged um, State Pete. We have asked and begged the state attorney. We have written um, Governor Ron DeSantis. Um, Ashley Moody, who, who's the um, attorney general for the state of Florida, please, all we want is for this case to be taken out of St. Pete's hands and just re-looked at. I, that's all we want. The evidence is there. You have failed. You don't want to look like you, you failed. did a good job. And so you just think we're going to go away. And we're not going away ever. Um, we need this case taken out of St. Pete's hands and we need a special prosecutor assigned to it and somebody to look at this um, and hold St. Pete accountable. I mean, how many other homicides are there? How many other families are out there that just let let this go because they don't have the fight in them? It, it's, it's just disgusting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> or they don't, or those people don't even have families, so then they really just don't have anybody fighting for them anymore. So I have one more big question, and then I don't even know if you can answer this question, and then I'm going to shut up because I know Vanessa has like a whole list of stuff that she was gonna, wanted to talk about before the other questions. Um, and like I said, you may not be able to answer this. Um, is there a potential that any of these people were, um, I don't, I don't know how to say it correctly, like a hardcore like drug snitch for the police department well Deontay may and listen we'll answer just about any question just so you know you guys know okay. and we you know Vanessa we will um Deontay Baker admitted to being a confidential informant for St. Petersburg police on the the federal trial he, he flat out admitted that um when the federal charges started coming about that investigation started developing the IRS agent actually who, who was kind of running that would would speak with us. Uh, it, it didn't last very long because once our question started, you know, getting deeper, he, he backed off and shut us down. But he did guarantee us. He said, I stake my career on this, that Butler is going to get 10 to 14 years. He said, I guarantee it. And uh, so we were we were thinking, OK, at, at least there's something there. At least if St. Pete's not doing something something is good going to happen to to for us to be at least happy about him going to prison so as soon as that happened butler then basically turned what they would call a snitch he agreed to cooperate with the feds he said i'll tell you pretty much whatever you want um you can see this too this is this is public record uh, not in these these words but basically he has to he has agreed to cooperate with law enforcement on whatever they need so then it got reduced to um, 40 months. So 10 to 14 years down to 40 months. Well, then Deontay Baker's charges came out, the drug charges, and he agreed, OK, I'll testify against him. So now it got dropped from 40 months to 27 months where he is currently in. Um, he, he was in Oklahoma, but right before we went and did this um, podcast with you guys, we saw that he's now in Connecticut, I believe. Um, they're, yeah, they're minimum. 
So With that's how much time left. September of this year, he gets out. Mm -hmm. So it's to our understanding that because of him snitching and ratting people out, because one of one of the the people that Taylor was also getting drugs from while she was living at Butler's house was arrested on some pretty serious drug charges. And it was just one hell of a coincidence that this guy gets arrested and Butler knew about him and has right. agreed to cooperate with law enforcement. So exactly. a lot of people that, are, mm -hmm. uh, reviewing the, that, that have reviewed this, looked over this case, have said, um, you know, it, it, it looks like it, almost like he's just this informant that they're they're protecting. And uh, whether or not that's the case, I don't know. But uh, with St. Pete's history of corruption, with, you know, the things that we've been told, uh, they, they have been completely disrespectful to Taylor, to our family. Um, they, they've, they've treated her like trash. They've treated us like trash. They refuse to even acknowledge us at this point, which we somewhat understand because we're very vocal about all of this on <laughs> social media. But, um, you know, uh, again, people have reached out to us telling us, you know, the experiences they may have had with Butler. Somebody reached out and said there was allegations that he's a pedophile. He molested some girl in the neighborhood years ago. I mean, this is just a, 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 a disgusting piece of shit. I mean, there's no other way to put it. It, it there, it really is. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you guys very much for answering those questions. I'm going to let Vanessa say what she wants to, because I keep interrupting. I apologize. Oh no, no. And we've gotten to pretty much everything because I mean, they're so thorough. I've gotten to, I mean, you've touched on almost everything. I do want to, um, there's a lot of really good comments. If you're able to go back and watch this and see the comments and we do have um, some contacts and some people that would like to help you in different ways and are offering to, so we can talk about that after uh, the interview too. Um, so I'd like to open it up now. You guys, I'm sorry if I missed your comments. I just wanted to hear and, and focus on what everything they were saying. So if you did throw up a question above and I missed it, if you don't mind uh, putting it back in for them and we could hit on a couple questions if there's anything. And I know that some of you had offered your help and I will extend those to them in contact information as soon as this is done too. Uh, one, one of the questions, I, what was the name of Butler's sister? Uh, it's Robin. Farley. Uh, I believe it's spelled F-A-R-L-A-Y, if I'm not mistaken. Okay. Um, let's see. I don't know why the mic cuts out a little bit like that. It kind of switches back and forth. Sorry, Leslie, they were having a little bit of trouble um, hearing you, but uh, it's, it's pretty good. Um, let's see. And then I know someone had asked where Butler is now. I don't know if we'd. Uh, he's a, a minimum security uh, federal prison in Danbury, Connecticut, I believe. And that's only for the money laundering, just for right. money laundering charges. And we talked on the phone a little bit before this that he had, uh, I don't know if you just touched on this because I was scrolling up for the comments um, that he had filed for the, um, what is that called? COVID. He was yeah. trying to get. Yeah, that you had mentioned that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It looks like he's still in there, but I mean, this guy's a coward. I mean, he, he's he's such a weak, pathetic individual that you know he it, nothing's going to surprise us. As right. What what he's doing. Um, yeah. Somebody had mentioned I saw earlier uh, about FDLE. We have contacted FDLE multiple times, and their response, and we've had other people, all you know, people that are supportive of us, um, have emailed them and and. Um, contacted them and their response is we don't investigate uh, police departments. We only assist in those investigations. Uh, they, re they will not help us. They will not contact us. The state attorney um, office here, they will, they refuse to, to talk to us. Um, we've emailed and had other people email Ron DeSantis Ashley Moody, as Leslie mentioned, because essentially they're the they're about the only ones that's going to be able to, to do anything at this point um, to get a special prosecutor assigned to this case. Rick Christman, he will not talk to us. 
Um, like Bill said, the state attorney, they won't talk to us. Um, Bernie McCabe has been the state attorney here for 30 years, and he just died on January 1st at 73 years old. So that's my next quest is to beg and plead whoever they assign as the new state attorney um, for our area is to see if they can help us or reopen this case or let us see other evidence or, um, and one other thing about St. Petersburg Police Department is um, to show Chief Holloway, what kind of person he is. His department was just, um, I think within the last year, year and a half, caught doing fraudulent um, overtime. Uh, like 59 officers were caught, 49 officers were caught uh, fraudul doing fraudulent um, time, time sheets. And um, Chief Holloway hit it. This is also in the paper. You can, you can find that. Um, and he, his answer was, it's my department. I will do the investigation and I will handle this, which means nothing's going to happen to any of those fraudulent um, timesheets. So that's just taxpayers' money going to nothing. Wow. I'm trying to follow along and answer everybody just yeah. out of respect for you guys listening to us. Um, it, somebody uh, asked about six days and we couldn't see her after six days. They never gave us an answer as to why we couldn't see her. Um, as Leslie had mentioned earlier, we, we saw her the first time, uh, after she was murdered in the funeral at, the, at her service. Um, so they, they never gave us an answer as to why we couldn't see her. Um, the, uh, we do that. Somebody mentioned a wrongful death. Uh, we did file a wrongful death and another suit. Uh, those were both settled. Um, and we do have the deposition for Butler, um, we have the transcripts uh, just for lack of a better way of putting it. We had a pretty badass attorney um, and, and we are able to, to get a, a lot of things through him. Uh, we share those things and if people are willing to help us and we know that they're legit um, and not like some, somebody had messaged us and said, I can help tell what happened to Taylor, but you got to send me the uncensored photo. Um, crime scene photos. I mean, you know, there's, there's some sick people. I think we all kind of know that. Um, but if we know that somebody's legit, you know, like you guys, and we'll forward you pretty much everything that we have. Anybody that will take the help from, from anywhere and anybody, you know, that, that generally wants to do that. And his federal um, and civil Butler's um, federal and civil depositions um, all contradict statements that he gave St. Pete on Taylor's case. Um, and St. Pete police did not attend any of the um, federal um, charges, didn't go to any of the um, trial um, or court dates. Um, and we contacted St. Pete and said, please pull those tra transcripts. He contradicts, he's not, and, and our civil attorney said the same thing. It's not the same, he's, his stories don't match. And St. Pete Police Department told us that's not our job. We don't pull depositions. Um, we, we don't we don't talk to medical examiners um, after they rule a homicide or a, give a determination of death. And we don't pull transcripts from civil and um, federal um, charges. Wow. Yeah, not their job. <clears throat> it's almost as if you know they're. Like, why would you not want that? I mean, you, you can obtain that stuff. And, and it's it's almost as if they're doing everything they can not to, to have to do anything with this case. And, you know, it, it that's where it, it makes you wonder about the corruption. Like, you know, people that are looking at this going, you know, we've seen cases with less evidence we've seen convictions with less evidence and one of the um upper administration that was part of the meeting his name's matthew first um we've posted about him too he's the one that likes to have affairs with other officers wives so you can just just the integrity we we know this is fact because it's in he was disciplined for our the the other guy was disciplined for it when he confronted him so this is you you can pull those um 
but he told us, he said, this is just a circumstantial case. And he said, you know, we, we know Butler did this, but this is just circumstantial. And I said, people were convicted on circumstantial evidence all the time. And he said, yeah, but they're also not. So, I mean, it, it's just, there's so much, there's, there's such a lack of respect and, and to treat the fam, you know, the victim's families like that. I mean, and who, who in the hell goes around call? I mean, we know Taylor was an addict. We know that she was, you know, prostituting, but to go around what and call parts somebody, of Taylor, you know, though, those are not, that's not who Taylor was. And those that's are just, things that Taylor had done and Taylor, but Taylor was still your daughter. She right. was still her twins mom. She was, she was somebody like, that's what I don't get is how is uh, it just becomes so categorized into, well, it's just not important because she was an addict, Like there's a whole other part of her life that, and a whole part of her life that she doesn't get to live where she wouldn't have been an addict or potentially would have been an addict. That's gone. Right. I'm sorry. That, that just upsets me. I don't get like that. It's mind boggling to me that anybody who goes into a career in law enforcement or in, in any of these fields, that's there to help people and to find justice is saying, well, I don't, we don't know what to tell you guys. We're sorry. Just go ahead and have a nice day and hope you're okay. Right. And that's yeah. the thing is that the four year, you know, it was four years um, on December 22nd, you know, four years that that um, has passed. And um, the last meeting we had with Chief Holloway, which never end well, um, he said, this is a cold case that's going to sit on a shelf um, unless a new lead comes in. We will contact you once a year on the anniversary date um, to give you any updates. Do you want an update even if there's no new information? And we said, yes, today's the eighth. We have not heard from St. Pete. They didn't put anything on any of their social media about an unsolved homicide. Um, December 22nd came and went. And um, I emailed them the other day and said, you know, thank you as Taylor's mother for calling. Thank you for keeping the promise that you would call us even if there was no information. I know we bash you but we lost our child and you lost the evidence that could have put Butler in jail. So excuse us if we're a little bit upset with your department, but at least you can have the decency to call and say, we remember Taylor. We know it's been four years. We send our condolences. They are worthless. Yeah. Um, uh, um trying to follow along a couple of questions. Uh, somebody had asked, do we think that she was alive when the um, three individuals came and picked her up? Uh, what we think is, uh, and I'm pretty sure we already covered this part of it, but I'll just say it again is based off of her injuries, what the medical examiner said, you know, Butler beat her severely. We do think she was barely alive when they got there. Um, but what he did to her is is what ended up killing her with I think he strangled her after he beat her um, and he knew that that she wasn't going to make it much longer. So um, that I try to answer that question. And then the fifth individual, somebody just said, can we have information? Because there was actually five people involved. We didn't even know about this fifth person until the federal trial. And this again, I just keep saying this for for your your audience. And, and so it doesn't get you guys in trouble because this is in the transcripts as well. Um, the fifth guy that was mentioned by Deontay Baker when he was on the stand is an individual by the name of Swamp Life Goo. Um, and you're probably saying what? Because the judge did too. They had to, he had to repeat it multiple times. That's the only name he gave. He didn't give his, his legal name. He just said he knows him as Swamp Life Goo and he was there. We mentioned that to, because you would think the police would want to talk to everybody that was there that night of a homicide. We mentioned that and told St. Pete police about that in the, one of the last meetings we had. And they just looked at us like uh, with, with a blank stare and they said, oh, okay. What, and what, he was there at Butler's house that night and in the car with them? Correct. According, to, yeah, according to Deontay Baker, according to Deontay Baker, he was there was four of them in the car when they came to Butler's. But the St. Pete police, they they have no intention of based off their response by their response. They have no intention of of talking or interviewing him. Anybody been able to find this guy? Yep. Amy. 
um, th th there's a, 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 we're so appreciative of everybody, but um, she, and she's on here tonight, Amy Sov, um, she has been incredible in, in, in helping us. Uh, the, the things that she does behind the scenes it, and, it can, been, find. and yeah. can find that, that girl is unbelievable. I mean, she, she is badass. So, so she found herself some swamp life goo. She did. Damn, Amy. No. And sometimes we get very uh, depressed and we stay off social media for a while. Um, but we have people like you and um, people that dig into these cases that, that help us keep going when we can't do it. And we have to take a break from social media and we have to take a break from just all of it, you know, just to stay sane and we cannot tell, you know, the public and social media and the podcast and you, Vanessa, you guys are amazing and you have helped us um, so much and you help us and you push us to keep going because uh, there are times that you just want to give up and, and we can't do that. So thank you guys for, for, um, we were very happy. I told you this before, Vanessa, and I'll say it again. We were very happy when we saw you pop up in our messages and said you were on board. So it's 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 our I'm honored to talk to you guys. I've we've been watching you for for a long time and looking at the posts and I admire your strength and how you're fighting for for Taylor so much. I really do admire you. You guys are so strong and determined and Taylor couldn't have pe better people and better family fighting for her. So we're, we want to do anything we can to help you. And we will do anything that we can to help you. Um, you know, anything you guys need, that's what we're, we're going to try to do. I've got a video coming now. We've got people lining up in comments that want to make contacts and get up and, you know, help after. So whatever you guys need. We're I feel watching. like you guys are Taylor's voice and we're just going to be your guys' echo. No, absolutely. Well put, well put. Yes. Well, we, we have a tremendous amount of, of, of love for people that do this for the right reasons. And and I know this is repetitive for Vanessa, but I didn't talk to you earlier. And you can tell when people are doing it and they're genuine. And you guys are. You you I mean, this uh this is unbelievable. And, and this is what we need. I mean, and, and getting into contact, I know Vanessa's already mentioned, I see him on here, Mark uh, Gillespie. Um, and absolutely we want him on board. Um, you know, we our, our goal obviously is to get justice for Taylor. And I'm trying to answer the, one of these questions. Um, the, uh, but we, if, if we're desperately trying to get national exposure to her case as well, um, we did do, there is a episode on still a mystery of uh, ID network of Taylor's. They did a very good job. They, they, they weren't afraid. Um, the local media is, is, is afraid to, to go after St. Pete because they're, they're they don't want to risk not getting information on other stories. So it's people like you that, that you don't care. You, you'll go after right. it and say what, then that's what we love. <laughs> and, um, so an ID did a pretty good job of that themselves. So we were we were very uh, blessed that they that they came on board with us. But, um, we, you know, we asked people just, you know, you can come to our page. Uh, you can message us. You can, you know, whatever you want to do. We, we always try to respond to people as best we can. But we just ask people to share uh, her case, share her story. Some of her videos on YouTube, I know, have on some of the YouTube channels have I think one was uh, up almost at like 500,000 views. Uh, I mean, that, that that's good. And it's because of what people like you guys do It's for people that are sitting here commenting and sharing and, and the, the power of that is just uh, far reaching, much more than people realize. So um, just, you know, we can't thank you guys enough. Oh, no, thank you guys for being Taylor's voice, man. You're, I, I, I say like the story is amazing and I, I don't say it's amazing and like it's, you know, in its glory it's amazing that four years later you guys ha are still fighting you're still sitting here you're, it's like it you ever you know all the details like it happened yesterday and it's amazing that there are people that are still willing to fight whether it was an addict or not 
Like I, I just, I cannot express that enough. I have addicts in my family. I've lost friends to addiction. It's, it doesn't make the person. And I, I'm, I know that that's your baby girl, but it's still, I mean, like you guys are out fighting for her and I'm personally, I love you guys for that. I really do that. You, no matter what, you don't ever give up on your baby. No, we love you too. And, and, and we're not going anywhere. They know we're not going anywhere that this is, you know, if this is their their feeble attempt to shut us down by ignoring us, uh, we're in this fight until we're not here anymore. And uh, and and you know, it's 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 not just you know we we've met other families that are going through you know the same exact thing. And uh, as Leslie mentioned before, some of them they they can't do it. It, it is it's it's it, it overwhelms you and it takes a toll on you. Um, I, I mean, the the, the stress of, of just you know, where you're trying to push through every single day. And, uh, you know, that that's just, we're, we're determined to get justice for her. There, there, there's, there's no question in our, our mind that, that we're going to do it. I have to ask you guys one more thing, just because out of my own yeah. curiosity, her, how much do her girls remind you guys of her? Oh, man. Uh, you know, it's, it's funny because they, they each have their own personality, but you definitely see Taylor and both of them. But they're both Taylor. I mean, yeah. you 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 can see uh, you know the defiance in, in one, and you can see you know the one that has all this compassion and love. They but they're both very loving and affectionate girls. Mm-hmm. But it, it's it's amazing just to see them and and how they are growing up and just the, the and they they love watching Taylor's videos. Um, you know they they were only two when this happened, but they they definitely remember her and and we're gonna you know make sure that 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 always stays that way much love there i love that thank you so much and you guys well we're gonna have more i would really love for you guys to come back on and we can talk more about it and oh we're gonna have the video out um i just this is just the beginning of our journey together and, and trying to get your voice out and any other creators we can get to to help out anything you guys just ask, but we really, you know, I appreciate all your time tonight and I appreciate all you guys and comments that have shown them so much love. Really do. So much thank, to everybody. Thank you guys. Uh, all tremendous mm-hmm. amount of love to each and every one of you supporting us. So Vanessa, Teresa, you guys are, you're badass and we, and we love you. So <laughs> you guys are badass. <laughs> thank, thank you, you so much. Um, and I'm going to get a hold of you guys right after the interview because I do have some important stuff that was in comments, and I, I just want to make sure that you got it and that we can get it to you. All right. Thank you. All right. Thank well, you guys have a great night, and uh, like I said, we'll be soon. Thank you guys all. Love you guys in comments. Thanks for all the love you guys have shown them, and you guys have a great weekend. Thank you.